So hi all, uh, we welcome you all to this Kubernetes workshop where we'll be learning the basics of Kubernetes spread across uh, two sessions. So we have designed this content in such a way that there are a number of lab sessions and this lab sessions has al also been updated in the GitHub repository for you to refer, uh, practice and learn at your own convenience. Okay, so now let's move on to the topics that will be covered in the first session. So in the first session, we are going to see what is container orchestration and its benefits, followed by we are going to dig deep into the Kubernetes architecture. And we are go also going to explore the Kubernetes clusters that can be deployed across both uh, cloud uh, solutions and also on the on-premise uh, solutions. Then we are going to have a couple of lab sessions. So in the first lab session, we are going to set up our first Kubernetes cluster using K3D. So this will be set up uh, this can be set up on the local laptop itself. Run some basic kubectl commands on top of this cluster. Finally, we are going to have some Q&A uh, where, where we'll be answering the questions that has been posted. So as I mentioned earlier, right, uh, we have uh, this content uh, uh, already uploaded in GitHub repository, and the content uh, is can be visited here. So we have uh, uh, all, uh, uploaded all the lab sessions step by step so that you can practice it at a later time. Okay, so now uh, I'll go on to the first uh, slide here. So before I begin, right, uh, in most of the slides, we would be referring the Kubernetes documents uh, of, across various topics. So the reason to refer this is like uh, the Kubernetes documents is considered as kind of a holy book with regards to Kubernetes. So each and every topic that is covered in this specific document, right? It details and it has all the details in a step-by-step -step procedure. So even for someone who is aspiring to write the certified Kubernetes ad administrator or a certified Kubernetes application developer, right? Uh, it's open book exam where you can actually refer this Kubernetes documents to uh, actually uh, complete the exam. So it is that vast and it has got all the details. So that is the reason we have shared this Kubernetes link wherever possible. Okay, so now let's move on to the first topic, which is container orchestration and its benefits. So what are containers and why do we need them? So before we go into container orchestration, right, I would like to actually explain what is containers and how it got evolved. So for this, I'm going to refer the Kubernetes link here. So as you can see in this diagram, right, in the traditional deployment, we'll be having a physical hardware and on top of this, we'll be running an operating system. So this operating system will be having multiple applications running on top of it. So the problem with this approach is there is no resource boundary. So for example, that could be one application that could be consuming large amount of resources that by slowing down another application. So this is not a viable approach. So in order to address this, that, that could be one other alternate solution here where we can actually tag one application to one physical server, but that is not a cost effective approach. So that is how this traditional deployment evolved into a virtualized deployment. So in a virtual de virtualized deployment, we are going to have the same physical hardware and operating system. But on top of the operating system, we are going to introduce a new component called hypervisor. So once we have this hypervisor, right, on top of this hypervisor, we can actually run multiple virtual machines. So these virtual machines will have its own operating system, binaries, and everything. So the advantage with this approach is we can actually uh, what does it bound an application to a specific resource and we can also have an advantage of application isolation but there is one drawback here the drawback here is we are introducing a number of intermediate layers like for example we have an operating system here and then a hypervisor and then again an operating system and then the binaries and then only we will have the application here so there are a lot, there are a lot of intermediaries here and these intermediaries also consume a lot of resources so what is the next approach? So that is how we have this concept called container deployment. So in this, what we are going to do is instead of hypervisor, we are introducing a new component called container runtime. So on top of this container runtime, we are going to convert our application into containers and then run on top of this. So what does this container runtime do? So this container runtime is like a component that is installed on the operating system. They actually help mount the containers and also interact with the kernel process and then help run the container effectively on a physical hardware. So that is the purpose of this container runtime. And how are we actually, what is a container here and what does it contain actually? So I would actually like to explain this with an example. 
So let's say I have actually uh, uh, developed an application on my uh, on my application which runs on like kind of a Python uh, 2.7 version. So this I have uh, developed locally on my laptop and I have also tested it locally. So now I need to, uh, what is it, deploy this application. I commit the code here and uh, this application will be deployed across multiple staging environments. So when this application is deployed under multiple staging environments, right, I can't actually guarantee this application will run the same Python version. So that could be uh, environments like kind of a staging, like kind of a test environment or a prod or pre-prod, which could be uh, running different Python versions different python versions so how do we address this so this container is actually a solution to your problem where we can actually reliably deploy an application across all the staging environments without worrying about any kind of 3pps or other os issues or anything so as i have seen shown in this di uh, diagram right container in a container we can actually uh, bundle a minimal three pps that are required and then an application can be uh, mount uh, can be bundled. so in for in my example i will be act actually uh, binding my python 2.7 as well along with that uh, along in the container so this will ensure my application runs without any issues across all staging environments so this is the advantage when we use containers so now uh, let's assume that i have developed my application in python 2.7 and uh, uh, I have deployed my application in a production environment. So what if I need to uh, scale up my application? Let's say my application is has ha is having a lot of traffic and uh, is used by multiple users. So how do I scale up my application uh, now? And what if I uh, introduce a new feature in my application and I also want to uh, uh, deploy this new version of my application in this uh, as a container? And also there could be also a disaster scenario where my application could get killed and uh, there needs, uh, I need to restart my application. So all this needs to be done without any kind of manual intervention. So that is when we have this container orchestration. So the container orchestration actually helps in managing the containers that are deployed in a, in a, in a deployment environment. So that, that is the advantage with regards to the container so as we mentioned here right since the since everything is a kind of an automated and no manual effort is required it helps in increased productivity and faster deployment of our application so considering the lesser amount of resources that the container is going to consume and the uh, effort that is required is quite minimal it also helps in reducing the cost of deployment and then we are we also have a stronger security here since the application is actually isolated and this container orchestration so gives us the benefits to isolate a container and also provides many RBAC rules wherein we can actually uh, what does it uh, reduce the attack on a given container right we can also easily scale up an application or scale down application based on the traffic that uh, that it gets and the faster error recovery so the, whenever the application fails right this container orchestration can actually help restart the container in a very quick time so now we have seen the benefits of container orchestration and why kubernetes so kubernetes is like kind of an uh, uh, what is it it's kind of a default container orchestration that is used globally across uh, uh, all the organizations so it is an open source project and it is recognized by the cloud native computing foundation as well so along with this kubernetes also provides various other advantages so it helps in load balancing so suppose if i'm going to scale up an application it helps the load balancing or, uh, and traffic, uh, traffic traffic routing to the specific containers that we have deployed and then station so if a container requires a, a storage or something it uh, also uh, has a provision to automatically provision the storage so like i said the automated rollout and rollbacks is provisioned by itself and then the self feeling that we just seen like whenever application fails it can automatically restart the application and the secret and configure configuration management so for example any application that we deploy right it requires or something to log in 
so be used uh, all throughout the application so rather than storing this credentials uh, uh, directly or packing them in the container kubernetes offers the options to store these containers as kind of a resource so that we can actually directly refer them uh, from externally so that we need not actually uh, uh, restart or rebuild an application whenever uh, there is a change in credentials so that's it about uh, the container orchestration and uh, we have also seen what is kubernetes at the basic level so now we go on to the next slide so in this next slide this is a kubernetes architecture so this is like kind of a high level architecture of kubernetes so the major components here are the control plane and the worker node so this control plane actually controls all the components that are deployed on the kubernetes cluster so then we have the worker node where the actual container runs so the control plane has got many components here like kind of an api server scheduler controller manager and etcd and the worker node also has some components that needs to be run so now we are going to see the functionality of each of this component so for uh, explaining this kubernetes architecture right i'm going to use a code flow document uh, which actually explains this architecture by using an uh, analogy of ship so let me open the um, document so as seen here right uh, uh, this control plane component is represented as kind of a master node here these are the four components and the worker node has this three components that is a kubelet kube proxy and the container runtime engine so so this will be used as kind of an uh, ship analogy here so as you can see the master node or the control plane will be recognized as kind of a controller ship and the worker node will be kind of a container uh, will be kind of a uh, container ship here so now let's go into the first component here so that is the etcd cluster that we have seen here the etcd cluster so what does etcd cluster do so any controller ship right uh, so it will uh, any controller ship will have a number of containers that are incoming and these containers are also transported onto the various uh, various uh, container ships so uh, it needs to we need to maintain some kind of an address book here where all these details are entered that is the incoming containers and where these containers are deployed and uh, what is the status of this container so this etcd cluster can can be compared to that of an address book so this etcd cluster acts as a key value store which has all the information related to the pods which are deployed onto the various uh, worker nodes and what is the status of the pods and when it has been started and everything so the etcd cluster acts as kind of a metadata information of all the resources that are deployed on a given kubernetes cluster so moving on to the next component so the next component here is the kube scheduler so what does kube scheduler do kube scheduler can be compared to the of a crane in a controller ship so the crane here right this is responsible for scheduling the container or transporting the container to various worker nodes similarly this kube scheduler is responsible for scheduling a container that has arrived here so whenever a new container is given to the introduced into the cluster this kube scheduler for scheduling this container onto the various worker nodes so this uh, this scheduling uh, considers many factors like for example it takes into account the resource capacity of that specific container and also the resource availability in that specific worker node so all these factors are taken into account before before a container is actually de deployed into an uh, worker node so moving on to the next component which is the controller manager so the controller manager is kind of a different offices that uh, that exists within a controller ship so all these uh, officers engage in some kind of maintenance activities like kind of a traffic na navigation or ship traffic uh, control or damage control and everything so similarly this controller manager here in uh, control plane right it has various sub components like kind of a node controller replication controller pod controller and various other components like for example this node controller here right this is re responsible for node management in a cluster so whenever a new worker node is introduced into the cluster this controller manager is responsible for uh, uh, taking into account of this new node and uh scheduling containers into this new node and also maintaining the balance between all the worker nodes 
similarly whenever a, whenever a node is down or something right this node controller makes note of it and also ensures that the pods that are running on the uh, specific uh, node is moved on to other uh, other available worker nodes so the controller manager is kind of a maintenance or the control uh, controller within kubernetes which has various sub components so now we have seen the three components in a uh, cluster that is the etcd controller manager and the scheduler so now we move on to the final component here which is the api server so what does api server do so api server is like kind of a centralized component which helps in communication between all these components both internally and as well as well as externally so it provides various api calls through which we can actually manage or communicate with the uh, with the cluster from outside and also this api calls are also used by the components internally to communicate or uh, uh, send messages between each other so this is like kind of a centralized component that is uh, actually uh, used by uh, uh, all the sub components within kubernetes so now we have seen the uh, all the uh, control plane components so next we move on to the components at the at the worker node level so the first component that we are going to see here is a container runtime engine so the container runtime engine we have seen in this previous slide also right we have this container engine so this is like kind of an uh, uh, default so this is like kind of a default service that needs to be run on any worker node so the purpose of this is like they help in mounting the container and also help interact with the kernel process to actually enable the communication or start and management of a pods on a given worker node so this is the purpose of this container runtime engine so the uh, the most popular ones are the docker container d and everything so the next component that we are going to see here is the kubelet so what is the purpose of this kubelet so kubelet can be compared to that of a captain of a ship so the captain of the ship is responsible for uh, uh, responsible for the containers that are run on a given worker node so along with this responsibilities he also sends uh, communicates with the control plane or the about the status of this containers similarly the kubelet here is responsible for the all the containers that are deployed in this worker node and this uh kubelet also periodically communicates with the uh, control plane to send the status of this containers and the status of this worker node so uh, yeah this is like kind of another node which uh, which acts as like acts like a captain of the ship on any given node so the next component that we are going to see here is a queue proxy so queue proxy let's say there is one container that is deployed in uh, one worker node so this uh, this worker node right uh, so this container needs to communicate with another application that is deployed on an other worker node so how does this communication actually takes place so that is where this queue proxy comes into the picture so the queue proxy helps in communication between these containers internally by setting up all the network configuration the traffic rules and everything uh, between this worker nodes so all this uh, internal communication takes place by with the help of queue proxy so now we have seen all the components that we uh, that we have uh, that we have just shown in this architecture diagram so the control plane has this etcd which acts as a metadata which has a metadata information of a cluster the controller manager controls various components like kind of a maintenance activities and the scheduler helps in scheduling the container on the worker nodes the api server is like kind of a centralized component which has all the api calls for both internal communication and external communication so this is about the control plane components and then the worker node components we saw the container runtime engine which helps in the uh, mounting of the pod and the working of the pod on a given node and then the kubelet which acts as a captain of a ship in managing all these containers and the final component which is the queue proxy which helps in the communication between the containers that are running on a cluster so this is the architecture so all through this uh, this through this couple of slides uh, mentioning about container but in this specific diagram right you could see a new component introduced called pod so what is a pod pod is a like kind of a minimal component that can be deployed in this cluster so pod is kind of is a place like kind of a container it could contain one container two container or more containers running on it 
so it is kind of a wrapper uh, wrapper on top of the container and this pod is a component that can be deployed on a on a given node so we will see like how this pod is deployed and how this pod runs and how this container is wrapped inside a pod in the uh, in the upcoming uh, slides okay so i'm done with this container orchestration so now next we have this uh, lab and i'm going to hand it over to kartik kartik go to you yeah thank you arun so yeah so let me share my screen as well okay hope you all can see my screen um so yeah we we talked about uh, the cluster uh, kubernetes cluster like what it is what is a kubernetes cluster and the architecture behind the cluster how it is built uh, and we talk, when we talk about the kubernetes cluster uh, we have two uh, primary classification one is the managed kubernetes cluster the other one is the unmanaged local or the on premise which is self hosted clusters so be aware of that fact that uh, we're not going to deploy today uh, uh, you know a cloud managed cluster what we are going to deploy is a locally installed kubernetes cluster so so when we talk about the managed clusters uh, what are the options available today we have uh, from amazon the eks which is the elastic kubernetes service from microsoft we have aks uh, azure kubernetes service and from google uh, the google kubernetes engine so these services are offered from the cloud vendors and uh, most of the control planes are managed by them so you will not have get access to the complete uh, control plane component so they will be managing the uh, control planes and you will, we will be responsible for the application deployment and management of the services within the cluster so and um, so that's the basic idea behind the cloud managed clusters cloud or cloud uh, administered kubernetes clusters and when we talk about self hosted clusters or the on premise clusters we will be creating the clusters using uh, one or two machines uh, physical servers or it could be a virtual machines we will be combining the virtual machines or the um, or the physical nodes with physical servers uh, uh, combined all together to form a cluster using one of the utilities uh, which is listed down there uh, um, like the cube adm cops mini cube k3 these are, these are the different utilities which are available which helps you create the clusters and you will require some resources uh, on the infrastructure be it it is a virtual machine or it is a physical server or it could be even a container so what we are going to make use of today is the one of the utility called k3d which is um, funded by rancher rancher community so i'll be using this utility to create the uh, clusters so enough here is let's jump on to the next um, topic of how to deploy this cluster on your local laptop or desktop okay so to set up the cluster uh, we have few prerequisites which needs to be completed um it the machine can be it, this cluster can be set up on your local laptop or desktop and the requirement is to get started off with a operating system which can be your windows 10 uh, primarily the version 2004 plus or later or you can have this uh, workshop done on uh, linux as well or on ubuntu uh, or on a mac system also this the same thing can be followed on all the operating systems uh, skipping few of the section uh, sessions listed uh, in the topics below so suppose if you are using the windows operating system we will get started off with installing the wsl environment so this wsl is nothing but windows subsystem for linux it comes with uh, windows 10 and uh, it it ships with the uh, linux kernel windows is shipping the uh, uh, later up, i mean uh, windows 10 plus uh, versions with the linux kernel so to activate the linux kernel you got to run this command wsl hyphen hyphen install okay so let me start the command prompt and uh, try to install this uh, wsl first so by default uh, if it is installed already you will get the command uh, help usage so which means that it is already installed so once installed you can reboot um, take a reboot of the machine and then come back to this uh, workshop page now the next command uh, to feed in is the installation of linux environment 
which is actually a Ubuntu variant of Linux is what we are going to run inside the WSL. So I'm going to do the copy and paste for most of the uh, uh, activity. So let's again uh, bring in this command prompt. So before that, let me um, show you. I don't have any other uh, environment other than the default uh, uh, WSL session installed on my laptop. I'm going to create a new Ubuntu uh, environment with the version Ubuntu 20.04. So while this uh, is getting installed, let's talk about the overview of what is what is going to be installed today uh, in a live environment. Like, so what I plan to install is um, set up an initial host cluster, host machine, which is my Windows machine, okay, Windows laptop, and uh, I'm going to wrap it up with the WSL, okay. Within that, I'm going to install. Um, a Docker environment. So there is going to be a Docker uh, environment that I'm going to install next. And then within the doctor, uh, Docker, I'm going to install the cluster, K3D cluster. And I'm going to call this cluster as dev cluster using K3D. Okay. Okay. So when you start the machine for the first time, you will be creating a user account for the machine for the Linux operating system. So we have the Linux uh, or the WSL setup done. So let's go back to the next step in the uh, workshop, which is the installation of Docker. So this, uh, you can follow the official Docker documentation to install the Docker engine, or you can copy and paste the information, whatever is available in this page. Sorry. This one, you don't require it anymore. So this is going to take some time. So let's get get back to the slide uh, what, which we are preparing. Um, so we have host host cluster ho, uh, host machine which is then we are installing Docker within that uh, WSL environment and then we are going to create a K3D dev cluster and this cluster is going to spin up a um, few components. Uh, one is the server component or the control plane of the, for the cluster. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, we are going to spin up uh, three worker nodes. Okay, so okay, so this forms our cluster. K3D cluster, uh, which is nothing but our Kubernetes cluster. This this one is nothing but your Kubernetes cluster. So why do we need this Docker uh, first, uh, first in first hands? Like, um, so Docker is as as we talked in the earlier slides, we need a container runtime to host the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, without container cluster, uh, Docker, uh, you know, uh, without a container runtime, Kubernetes cluster cannot run. And this K3D uh, uses this Docker container engine. So what we are going, uh, going to do here is, uh, we are going to follow an inception model of uh, installation, wherein um, cluster is going to have its own container runtime. Um, 
and uh, we are going to wrap up this cluster and then put it inside a container so it is like a virtual machine inside virtual machine that is how it is going to function so so far we have installed the wsl wrapper and then we created a machine and then we are in the process of installing the docker first okay so let's wait for the installation to complete so as you can see the container runtime is getting installed so it depends on the network speed and uh, the bandwidth that server which is going to have uh, send you the packages so based on that it, it, the installation time can vary so we do have the other forms of self hosted clusters which makes use of uh, the utilities uh, through which you can build the cluster one of them kind is that mini cube which comes with ubuntu operating system so the primary difference between these uh, utilities is like how the backend is handled uh, for example k3d makes use of docker to create the cluster mini cube use system ctl service to create the clusters and kubeadm or cops will make use of the server um, the node uh, primary node itself to create the clusters and kind also makes use of the docker images or the services to create the clusters so it, it's purely up to the preference of individual who want to create the cluster can you make use of any uh, any of these utilities to create the new clusters so the container runtime is installed uh, ne next the docker command line utility is being installed so once this is installed we will have the docker run uh, runtime installed and uh, then we will be uh, able to install the k3d which is the utility which we are going to make use of and create the cluster so each of this worker node is going to host pods okay so like um, so each worker node can host um, as as many pods at, as it require, as it want uh, as as is created by the control plane control plane will decide uh, which which pod to run on which worker node based on the available metrics uh, available uh, capacity suppose this worker one has uh, more resources available cpu and memory it will try to allocate the pod in, uh, into that worker one and if it finds that there is not enough capacity available cpu or memory is not sufficient then it will move this pod uh, it will, it, or it will try to create the uh, next pod in the next worker node so that is how the control plane will decide on uh, like how to allocate the pod uh, how to how the new deployment is created on which no, which worker node the workload is sent to okay okay so almost the docker is installed now and if you have a docker for desktop or rancher desktop installed on the windows machine you will be able to create the kubernetes cluster right away it is not recommended uh, as it um, has some limitations in the form of uh, using the cluster real cluster uh, we will not be able to make use of uh, our own ingress or load balancer using the ready made cluster which the docker desktop uh, provides so that's why we are creating a cluster using uh, a perfect uh, environment which we are going to create using the k3d so once the docker is installed we are going to have a um, startup script added so that the docker daemon gets started at each time when you boot up the wsl machine 
So most for most of the workshop session, I'll be going, doing the copy and paste uh, because that works. Uh, we don't have to, you know, copy and uh, manually copy or manually type the commands uh, into the terminal. Okay, so it is added, and uh, we got to add a pseudo rules so that uh, you will have the privilege to start the Docker daemon as normal user. And then uh, we need to add the user, uh, that is your own first user to the Docker user group. So these are all part of the Docker installation. Uh, we are not yet to, we haven't reached the reached to the point where we are going to deploy the Kubernetes cluster. So Docker installation is completed and we configured it to auto start. Now let's, let's reboot this machine which we created, the WSL machine. So this has to be done outside the uh, WSL terminal. So let's go back to the command prompt. Let's terminate the new machine which we created. And then boot up the machine. Okay. Yeah. So the first step is completed. Let's have the uh, second, I mean, the next step uh, installed and uh, completed. So we need to have a browser installed. Um, so which is because we, whenever we are deploying an application in the cluster, we want to verify the application on a, um, you know, UI. Basically, you need a browser to verify the web applications. So uh, by default, the Ubuntu doesn't comes with an, uh, the, the WSL environment doesn't have a browser installed. If you type Google Chrome, it will not, it will say that it's, the application is not installed or the command not formed. So we got to install a basic browser. So once it is installed, we can install, uh, I mean, once the application package is fetched, you can install it directly. So to summarize what we have installed so far is, uh, we have installed the WSL Linux, which is the Ubuntu 20.2004. We have installed the Docker, Docker runtime and configured it to auto start. And uh, we are in the process of installing the Chrome browser now. So remember, uh, if you're using a Linux operating system, uh, native Linux uh, without Windows, then you can skip this first, pa first part of this workshop which is installing WSL and Linux. And similarly, you can skip this part, install GWSL, which we will be installing next. And you can directly right away install the Docker and Chrome on your Linux machine or Mac, and then you can get started with the installation of Kubernetes cluster. So these are preparations which we are doing now. Uh, we are not uh, reached the point where we will be installing the cluster, actual cluster. So since it's taking some time, um, let me do one thing here. So once the package is downloaded, you can install the package using this command.
okay let's wait for the installation to complete then sorry the package download to complete it's almost 70 percent now let's wait for a couple of minutes this should get completed So you can install any browser. Uh, it, it's not mandatory that you should install Chrome. You can install Firefox as well. Um, since Chrome follows the most uh, uh, web standards, I'm installing this browser. It's purely up to the choice of an individual who wants to use the, you know, uh, validate the web applications. So there we have the package downloaded. Um, so let's go back to the workshop material. So we have kickstarted the installation of Chrome browser. So while that happens, let's go on to the next uh, step of uh, installing GWSL. So why this component is required is because um, you need a, a you know ui to verify your application as i mentioned in the previous step so you need a browser but the browser will not know uh, where to render the browser since it is installed inside a virtual machine this whole wsl itself is a virtual machine so the virtual machine will not have a ui by default the wsl machine will not have a ui so in order to activate the ui you need a, a x server component so this X server component is installed with the Windows 11, but Windows 10 will not have that component installed. So we got to install it manually. So you can head to this uh, URL and download the GWSL component. Okay, so once the, uh, that is downloaded, you can install that. So Chrome is being installed on the Linux system. GWS component is being installed in your Windows, Windows host machine. Okay, and this optional component GWSL is not required to be installed if you're using uh, Linux or Mac. So it's purely in a Windows environment, we need, we'll, we need this dependency to be installed. Uh, and that too, it is required only if you're using uh, to verify uh, uh, UA, uh, GUA applications like a web application or even uh, native applications, graphical applications, which is which which is being developed in a Linux environment. OK, 
Okay, so this is the last preparatory steps that we need to complete um, before we start with the installation of Kubernetes cluster. So GWS is, uh, uh, GWSL is installed. So let's finish. So what this does is it will redirect the display port to your Windows machine. So this is your terminal, Linux terminal. And this is uh, Windows, uh, you know, display uh, service is running within the GWSL um, application. It starts on next service. So it can, it is, it has the capability to receive the forwarded port information from the virtual machine. So the configuration is very simple. So once the installation is completed, uh, Chrome browser is completed, I will show you how to configure it. So basically you have two mode of configuration. One is the automatic configuration of GWSL, uh, wherein you just need to click this option not to export display or audio. So which will activate the display feature for your virtual Linux. The other, uh, the second method is to set it manually inside your virtual machine uh, or the Linux or WSL environment. So these two steps has to be completed if you are configured manually, but uh, let's follow the automatic method of configuration. So yeah, <clears throat> Chrome is installed, but if you run the uh, Chrome browser now from the terminal, so it will not work because we don't have a display port or the Linux machine doesn't know where to render this Chrome browser. So for that reason, we are going to make use of this GWSL. So let's click this and go to GWSL distro tools. Click the machine which we installed Ubuntu 20.04. And uh, click this option of auto export display or audio. It will ask you, to, it will prompt you to restart the machine. Click yes. Okay, so it has machine. So let's reboot the machine again. I mean, boot the Ubuntu machine again. So now, so let's verify the Docker service once. Yeah, Docker is running. So now if you run Google Chrome, it will open the browser on your Windows machine. So this Chrome browser is from Windows, called in WSL uh, wrapper. Okay, so let's verify. Uh... So it's next, which is our section, which is the installation of cluster. So it will be installed the utility first, 
the k3d utility with which we will be spinning up the cluster so the installation of k3d is very simple it's a just a single line command execution i have copied that so i don't need this uh, terminal anymore so let's close this uh, browser browser for now so we'll be using the browser in the next uh, session so where we'll be deploying the uh, application inside the cluster so before that uh, let's start with the installation of the cluster so yeah, let's me copy it again So it is installed. You can just verify by running this command k3d version. So it has installed the latest version of k3d, which is 5.4. So that is where, uh, what we have executed. So yeah, the next step is to install the uh, cluster itself. So this is the primary step uh, which, with which we will be creating the cluster, Kubernetes cluster. So this command is going to create a new cluster in the uh, WSL environment, which we created just now. So the command is self-explanatory pretty much. Um, so here we have a parameter called agents, which is nothing but uh, the worker nodes, number of worker nodes. So I've mentioned here is three. So we're going to spin up three worker nodes and uh, one server. The server we haven't mentioned, but you can give it as a parameter, extra parameter and give the number of servers you want, number of control planes you want. I have disabled the uh, some inbuilt feature that the K3D creates a cluster along with. So one is the traffic ingress and the other is the load balancer. I don't want these, these, these two components. In fact, I'll be installing these two uh, from a different vendor, okay? So, and then also I'll be creating a registry for the container images with this option registry create and the container registry name on a specific port number, okay? So the, why do we need a container registry? Uh, I will come to the point in the next slide. So let's copy and paste this command and see the cluster creation going on in, in the back end. So it is going to spin up several containers. Since K3D is going to create multiple containers and each container is going to represent a node, okay? So let me have another terminal window opened so that uh, we can have So as you can see, there are a few containers already spinned up. You can see uh, the dev registry, which is the node, which actually represents a node here. But since we do not have a dedicated machine, so all the machines are represented as a container, Docker container. This dev registry is a node, but it is actually running as a container. This server node, which is actually the control plane for our cluster, itself is running as a container image with the container ID. And we I have mentioned that that we'll be using three worker nodes. These three worker nodes again themselves of running running as containers. Okay. And uh, if you talk about the memory requirements for this cluster, it is very minimal. Um, let me show you the Docker stats. Let's see the consumption of memory. How much they are using? It's pretty much very low. So these are very, very minimum when, when you compare it to your real time full cluster using Kubernetes cluster, if, if you're spending it on a real virtual uh, physical machine on a virtual machine, this will, this would be obviously in terms of gigabyte. But here we, what we see is in MBs, in terms of MBs, which means it's very lightweight. This cluster can be run on your local laptop on a, uh, typically on a machine with a very least configuration, like even a 4GB system can uh, is capable of running this kind of Kubernetes cluster. Okay. So it is spinned up and the cluster is completely ready. You can see the it has spent a successful message. So now we'll, let's see whether the, uh, the cluster is up and running. 
there are few commands which is uh, the k3 utility comes with which verify um, and see the details about the cluster so one of them is the cluster list and see we can create multiple clusters in fact you don't have to end up with using only one cluster you can have multiple clusters created using this k3 utility okay now um, so this is about the cluster company cluster administration you can make use of k3 command but suppose if you want to have the insights into the cluster like what is running within the cluster then you need to make use of a command called kubectl so this kubectl binary is a utility that uh, is provided by kubernetes um, uh, community and that is an cli utility okay which is uh, provided by the google and it it talks to the api server and retrieves the information from the cluster whereas k3 will not be will not have the capability to talk to the kubernetes api servers but this will have that capability so let's go and install the kubectl next so again it's a couple of uh, commands to install these utilities it's not a uh, it's not a big thing to install these uh, utilities it's like uh, very simple it's a single binary so just uh, pull it from the url and move it to the local directories that's it So this is for the Linux version of uh, kubectl. If you want to install it for Mac or uh, native Windows system, then you got to hit this URL and uh, you know go to the portal and download the uh, one that is available for your operating system. This is for purely for the Linux one, Linux variant kubectl. Yeah, it is downloaded and installed, which you can verify now. It should it should print yes. So you can uh, run a few commands to check whether your Kubernetes cluster, installed Kubernetes cluster is functional. You can see uh, the nodes command is listing all the component of the cluster. We have one master server and then three worker nodes. And this is the version of the Kubernetes cluster that we have installed, 1.22.7. And if you want to get all the resources that are installed in the cluster, can run this command kubectl get all life and a so that is going to throw out a few resources which are running inside the cluster starting from the namespace um, by, by default we will have two namespace one is a cube system and the other one is the default one and within the namespace you will have pods services deployments and replica sets so these are the default resources that comes with the cluster we'll be installing few more resources on top of this uh, already available uh, and running uh, resources. So let's uh, remember, I have disabled the ingress controller and the load, ba load balancer when I pr uh, provision the cluster. So now I will be installing them. And um, for the registry, which we have installed, it's a private registry, which is going to, which we'll be using for our uh, internal image build process. Uh, in the upcoming session, we'll be building the image, container images on our own for the application which we create and we'll be pushing the registry uh, container onto the private registry so to talk to the registry we need to add one more entry to the etc host file okay so otherwise if you if i simple simply ping this dev registry from the terminal it will say it is not found so we need to have a fake dns created for the registry so let's do that Okay, and then, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, sorry. 
So we we are going to bring back the ingress and the load balancer. And uh, so this two, these two commands are going to install the load balancer. And it is going to install a load balancer called uh, metal LB. Okay, and Docker is dead. Docker. Okay, you will see a few messages like this, uh, which are nothing but the Kubernetes resources which are specific to this Metal LB load balancer. I'm installing this Metal load balancer service because uh, uh, on on if you're you know having your cluster on a managed cluster, installed as part um, in the cloud uh, cloud managed clusters. Uh, this is not added as a component uh, in the real, but it is uh, you know the cloud managed clusters comes with. Uh, we're going to simulate the similar behavior on our local cluster. So, selling the third party load balancer called. Now we need to configure the load balancer. We install the load balancer. We're going to configure the load balancer in the next steps. So, um, so I hope you all aware of uh, what is a load balancer and what is the function of your load balancer. So this load balancer is going to take the traffic from an external world, um, typically from the user who is going to invoke a solution, uh, in, invoke an application which is running uh, in, on a remote server or remote cluster. When you want to access an application, it is uh, usually directed through a load balancer IP. Okay, so this load balance IP is typically requires a public IP. And since we do not have a public IP in our local machine, we're going to simulate some few public IPs. Uh, we're going to fake down uh, the public, uh, public IPs uh, from your local network. So that is what we are going to do now. So there are a few variables that we are creating here, which is going to take the IPs from the network, locally installed uh, dev cluster network. This is the cluster we, which we created. And we're going to create a subnet, and then within that subnet, we are going to fetch in few IPs and allocate it to this range variable. Uh, let me show the, show you that variable output. So this is the subnet which we are going to use for our load balancer um, network. Okay, and we're going to create a config map. This config map is a resource a resource type within the cluster. Uh, which is going to store configurational uh, information about the um, an application. Any it could be an any application. So in this case, the config map is holding few information about our uh, load balancer addresses. Okay. Yeah. So config map is created. So now load balance is configured. So let's go and install the ingress controller. An ingress controller is a special Kubernetes resource type, which is usually used in the case where we will be using domain names and an internal application, which is cluster. So when we host multiple applications within the Kubernetes cluster, each application can be accessed, uh, uh, will be accessed using a domain name. So and this domain name has to be rerouted to the traffic uh, within the intra cluster services. So we'll be requiring uh, services and then ingresses for it. So it is always good to have an ingress uh, installed. So now the ingress as well, uh, 
this uh, So now you will be seeing four additional resources which we have installed earlier. The uh, before we installed a load balancer ingress, these were not available. It was a new namespace that was created, and we have a few pods running under the namespace. Also, ingress iPhone nginx has been created, and it is running. It is running its own set of pods. And we see that uh, the load balance IP, which we talked about earlier, was assigned to the ingress controller, through which we will be able to access our applications. So this, uh, in the next section, we'll be installing the applications, uh, and we will see how to access those applications from an external world, and uh, how the, how do we build an application, how do we deploy an application in a container registry, and how to fetch that application and uh, put it in a container pod and then access them from the browser web browser. So that is what we're going to cover in the next session. So now pretty much our cluster is up and running with all the components we have installed. You can see all, everything is in running status. So we have installed a load balancer ingress, the basic cluster. Yeah, pretty much that's it. So I will have it uh, handed over to Harun to go over a few basic commands using the kubectl utility. Yeah, thank, thank you, Karthik. Yeah. Let me uh, share the session, share the screen here. Hope you guys can see my screen. Can you guys see, see my screen? Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please okay. So uh, I have actually set up my cluster here using uh, K3D. So this is a local cluster that I have set here and it is uh, created by the name local cluster. So we are going to execute some basic kubectl commands on top of this cluster, okay? So as Karthik explained, right, kubectl is kind of a command line utility that is provided by Kubernetes to interact with a given cluster. So there could be multiple number of clusters and uh, we need to interact with that cluster for managing our resources or for deploying our resources. So kubectl is one form where we can communicate with the kube API that we defined here. So the API server is there, right? If we need to interact with it, one of the option is to use this kubectl. So as Karthik uh, just now said, right, that there are, uh, kubectl is installable on multiple flavors. So uh, in, uh, these are step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, that I think Karthik showed us a demo on how to install on Linux, but we can install kubectl on Mac OS, Windows, and everything. So this uh, steps that is mentioned here is straightforward, and you can easily install them locally. So in my uh, in my local machine, I've installed this kubectl. Now I will be connecting to that cluster. So you can see, right, I have this kubectl locally, and uh, I could have like uh, there may be even three to four clusters that are uh, uh, that I have created here. So how does kubectl know to which cluster it needs to connect? So that is why we have something called kube config. So this, this kube config, right? This will hold the information of the cluster, like the IP details and the uh, username, password, or some kind of a token through which we can uh, uh, kubectl will know that it is the cluster that we need to communicate. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to execute this command now. So as you can see, right, with K3D, I'm going, I'm getting this kube, uh, kube config from get local cluster, which is the local cluster name here, and I'm redirecting it to an uh, uh, location. So this uh, file will be in a kind of YAML file. So I'm just going to open this file for your reference. So this will have all the details that are required for a kubectl to connect to a given kube, uh, Kubernetes cluster. So you could see the cluster details, a user, and all the tokens and everything. So any cluster that you need to create, you just need to give this k3d kubeconfig get local with the get cluster name, and you'll have a YAML manifest which you can uh, use it for connecting to the cluster. So now I have downloaded this file. So what is the next step here? I need to uh, define an environmental variable here. So this environmental variable should be export kube config and the file location of this uh, kube config. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to I'm going to export this kube config now. 
So I've exported this now. So now I should be able to connect to the cluster. I'm going to give kubectl get nodes now. So you can see I have deployed a three node cluster here. So the three node cluster is I have a control plane. So as mentioned in this architecture diagram, right? I have a control plane and two worker nodes in my cluster. So what is the first thing that I'm going to do now here? The first thing that I'm going to do now after I have uh, connected to the cluster is I'm going to give, get the version of the cluster. So you can get the version by giving kubectl version. So this will actually give you two versions. The one is the client version. So the client version is a kubectl version of the component of the client that I have uh, installed. And the other version is the server version. So uh, this server version that that uh, the cluster that I've uh, that I've uh, created, right? It is running in 1.21.5. So this is a Kubernetes version that I have created. So we can get the version details by using kubectl version. So the next command that I'm going to run here is a kubectl. So what does it uh, throw? So as we mentioned uh, 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 here, right? We we have this API server uh, and all the communication. With, uh, with the with the Kubernetes cluster takes place through this API calls. So this kubectl uh, should actually know what API should be uh, should be contacted to manage or do something. So these are the various API components that are available. So this list, right? This list based on the Kubernetes version. So this is the list of versions that is available for this specific uh, Kubernetes version, whereas a version, uh, the, the next version or 1.22 would have a different set of lists. So the, in that list, right, some of the APIs listed down here could have been deprecated or we could even have some new, new APIs that are created. So whenever we need to communicate or when in, whenever we need to execute something it is best to refer like what is it available apis and then we can uh, uh, run run or interact with the cluster so this is about api versions so now i'm going to list the resource i think we, we have already listed down uh, kathik showed or how to list on the resource but i'm going to show show uh, once again so she can see kubectl get nodes which I executed previously. So this will show you the nodes that are, uh, are running. And one more concept that uh, we are going to see here is namespace. So what is a namespace here? So this, these are the available namespaces. So namespace is nothing but kind of a logical partition in a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, as we know, right, when we move into various staging environments, uh, one cluster could be used by multiple application teams. So that could be one, apl uh, one application that needs, the, or the, uh, this cluster could be shared by multiple teams. So how do we segregate them logically? So that is where this namespace helps. So once we create a namespace, right, we can actually allow or permit that one application team to use that specific namespace alone. So that way they will have their own uh, kind of na namespace where they can run their pods and everything. So let me create one namespace here. For example, I'm going to create a namespace app one. So the app one is created and I'm going to create another namespace called app two. So if I give get namespace, right, I'll be having two namespaces. So each namespaces can be allocated to one application team and they will have exclusive access to this namespace to deploy their resources on this uh, specific, uh, this one. So now I'm going to see, so on. Uh, so let, let us see like what is the components that are available in this app phone namespace. So if I'm going to give kubectl hyphen n, hyphen n is nothing but namespace, and I'm going to give the app one as the namespace name. So I'm going to give get pods. So you can see nothing is deployed in the specific uh, namespace. So by default, right, if, you, if you're not going to give this namespace name, the application will be, uh, uh, the application or the pods will be de uh, deployed by default into this default namespace. So if I'm going to give group CTL get pods, you can see no resources found in default namespace. Since I have not specified this namespace name, it will actually execute this command uh, on this default namespace. So since this is a newly created cluster, we won't have, uh, we don't have any resources uh, right now running. So now we are going to deploy our first pod on this on this cluster. So I'm going to use uh, Nginx to uh, Nginx as the first pod that I'm going to deploy here. So Nginx, as you know, is kind of a web server, and I'm going to use the image Nginx. 
So this Nginx image will be downloaded from Docker Hub, which is kind of a uh, uh, public repository which, which hosts all these images. So I think even Karthik explained about creating one local registry, right? So this uh, 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 Docker Hub is kind of a public res uh, registry which can be used by anyone or any uh, open source softwares to upload their images. So I'm going to run this command and we, uh, this should create this. Pod. Let's see what happens. So you can see this container is creating and suppose what exactly is happening, right? I can give this kubectl describe pod and give the pod name. So the pod name here is nginx and I'm going to give this here. So you can see in this event, right? What exactly is happening? So this pod is getting scheduled, scheduled on the agent one, that is a worker node. And it is trying to pull the image from nginx uh, public repository. So the image is successfully pulled now and the container is created and the container is started now. So now I'm going to give this kubectl get pod command. So you can see this nginx pod, one minute, I'm just pull this to the top. So you can see this nginx uh, pod is running now. So what is, so this command, describe command will show you what exactly is happening. So now if you need to know what exactly is happening inside this pod, there is one more command called kubectl log and I need to give the pod name. Docs. If I give here, right, it actually prints what exactly is happening inside the pod. So you can see like this, the, the process has started and the, uh, and the pod is up and running now. So this is, uh, this is how you, you can check the logs of a, uh, logs of a uh, pod that is deployed. And then uh, also the, the describe option will give you a detail about uh, uh, what exactly is deployed. So if you see here, right, uh, earlier shown in this diagram, that pod is nothing but a combination of one or two containers. So in this case, right, we have deployed only one container, which is Nginx. So that is why we see like Ng the container is uh, containers. So since I said pod can have one or two containers, so it's mentioned as container Nginx. So the container image is downloaded from the Docker Hub, and this are the uh, this are like the various environments or the various. Uh, or, uh, what is it created or configurations that is done when creating this so if i'm going to have one more container i i, I will be having another uh, kind of a pointer here with that container name so this is the uh, these are the commands that i wanted to show you and uh, similarly uh, just like we explained uh, uh, what is uh, what is there in describe what is what is there in a pod right we can also describe the at the node level so I'm going to execute this command, kubectl describe node, and I'm going to pick this agent one. So if I pick this right, I will be able to uh, see all the details here. That is, uh, what are the labels and what is the available uh, CPU capacity and what are the pods that are running on this machine. So if you can see this uh, earlier, we saw, right, this uh, Nginx pod was allocated here. So here you can see the Nginx pod is allocated here. And we can also see the events of the specific node. like how this node is synced and how this agent and everything is running and how the agents and the kubelet proxy and everything has started now. So this will give you all the details of at the node level. So with regards to scaling and deploying application, uh, we will we'll go through the steps when we uh, uh, do uh, or uh, deploy an application in the next workshop, in the next uh, second session. So uh, that's all uh, uh, we have for this first session. And we are open to uh, questions. Yeah, I already see a question being posted in that. Um, so K3D is ready for production. Yes, um, but but the primary development um, for the K3D is uh, for local development only. It's not ready for production. Although it's a mature tool and it can take up the production workloads, but it is not re really recommended for uh, real time production environment because it runs on top of Docker. Docker is almost deprecated now, but it is still being used in few commercial uh, projects and organizations. But um, going forward, like in future, it will be completely deprecated and uh, people will be moving towards container D and uh, different other virtualizations. Um, so the primary uh, objective of K3D is to have a lo local development environment. So where a developer can develop their applications and want to test their applications in a cluster, they cannot afford to spend uh, you know a, a lot of money invested in a cloud 
cloud vendor where they provide the service and take up their service and then product, uh, deploy the applications in their cloud uh, cloud based uh, kubernetes cluster and test their applications it's really an expensive way of testing their applications so it's really meant for local development and also it's a um, way of going forward the all the edge and uh, iot nodes and these kind of projects we can make use of k3d because it's it's very very you know least like the k3d binary itself is in 50 mb space um, so for that reason it's really recommended for a very less uh, you know resource crunch uh, environment where we can deploy this cluster and make use of yeah and the question is container d so container d is like just docker d so docker uses a container environment called docker d container d is uh, is a cloud native um, you know um, uh, container environment container d is an um, C, 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 uh, sorry, CRA uh, authorized environment, which is cloud uh, cloud native runtime environment. Like that, we have CNI, CSI, cloud native storage interface, cloud native network interface. We have multiple terminologies related to that. So each, uh, so they, they all, you know, definite standards which uh, cloud native foundations have uh, specified and formulated. So anyone can take up those standards and develop their applications. So this container D is one of the standards, uh, one of the form of uh, cloud, uh, you know, cloud native runtime environment uh, based daemon, which is uh, authorized to take the container workloads. It's it's very similar to Docker D. Docker D is uh, specific to Docker. Container D is specific to uh, relative to it's it's an open source runtime environment. Any tool can talk to the container D uh, uh, backend. So that's what it is. Thank you, Pratik. I think there is one more yeah. uh, to namespace. So let me uh, share my screen to explain that same uh, again. So I have just opened one diagram. Uh, uh, so, so the question in part of uh, like, uh, can we have multiple clusters for one namespace? No. Uh, so this namespace is right. These are like logical partitions only within. So it's like kind uh, in this K it is cluster that you can see, right? You can see the default namespace, dev namespace, or Q na QA namespace. So similarly, if I give this kubectl get namespace, the ls is short form for namespace. So I have created multiple partitions here. So these are like kind of a default partitions. The default is something that is created by itself on cube system. So this cube system, right? This will host all the uh, system related parts that are required for this container to run. So again, we created this app one and app two. So uh, to explain it again, right? Let's say there are two applications, and if I'm going to deploy both this application into uh, Kubernetes, and uh, uh, let's say if I'm going to create uh, create this application in the namespace uh, default itself. So we will have nginx running here, and there is well, there will be one one other application like kind of a Tomcat that will be running on the same uh, namespace. So this could actually be confusing, or uh, we will not know like uh, who is actually working on the specific pod, or how do we maintain this. So that is why we are isolating uh, uh, this application within the namespace. Like we can we could actually use it for another scenario as well. Like uh, what if we are running a cluster which hosts all the pre prod and the test environments itself. So the nginx could be the name of the application but it needs to be deployed uh, twice like one for the testing environment and one for the pre-production environment so on that in that case we can have two kind of namespaces here i can create namespace uh, pre-prod and i can create namespace test here so i can deploy this uh, pod on both this uh, namespaces so the one will be for the testing purpose, which will be given to the testing team to work on this specific pod. The other will be kind of a pre-prod, which will be used by the uh, various uh, uh, various users, end users, to actually see like what is or, or how the application behaves and everything. So I hope this is clear now. The namespace it can be it's like uh, segregation only within the cluster. Ah, uh, all would have very informative i thank you mr kartik and mr arun for uh, this enlightening workshop on kubernetes uh, audience at part 3 and 4 of this workshop at 2 15 pm so please stay tuned and uh, for any other questions you have please post it in our slack channel i think mr kartik and mr arun would be happy to answer them uh, last but not the least i thank all the audience for
I request the participants to please switch over to comment track. We have the fun games going on right now. There, one o'clock. We have a keynote speech as well. So the next session in this beginner track will begin by one forty-four, forty-five. So once again, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Karthik, and thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you all. So uh, welcome back again. So I hope you like the topic that we uh, uh, did in the first session. So now back to the second session. So in this second session, we are going to cover the following topics. That is how to deploy and how to scale an application. So the next one is like how do we export this application using services and port forwarding. So now then we are going to have a lab session where we are going to deploy this cloud native application. On a Kubernetes cluster, so followed by observability. So this observability session will include uh, the monitoring, metrics collection, logging, and basic level of troubleshooting. Followed finally by Q&A. So, as in the previous uh, uh, session, right, we have all this content uh, readily available in the specific uh, workshop URL. So, uh, and this uh, the content as well is also available on I'm just. The content as well is available in this GitHub uh, repository. So sorry. Yeah. So the content uh, is also available in this GitHub repository. So now we will go on to this first slide. So, which is about uh, how do we deploy and scale an application? So here is like kind of an overflow of like how an application is deployed into Kubernetes. So as you can see here, right, a developer here will be writing his code on a local laptop. So once the application code is written, then he will be writing a Docker file. So what is a Docker file? So the Docker file, right? Let me show you the Docker file. Probably we can take an online example somewhere here, which could. So this could be a basic Docker file that uh, that could be returned by that application developer. So what would this Docker uh, uh, Docker file contain? So in this previous first session, right, we would have seen a container should have a minimal OS, the three PP binaries, and then the application. So in order for, uh, to build this container, right, we need a Docker file. So that Docker file is built uh, will have this kind of commands like here I am deploying a base Ubuntu image and then I am uh, uh, installing uh, utilities like htop and uh, uh, components that are required for my application to run. So this is kind of a basic Docker file that an uh, application developer needs to write. Then once this Docker file is written, right? So using this Docker file, this application is converted into a container image. So now we have a container image ready to be deployed into Kubernetes. So we have these two components here, which actually defines how this application needs to be deployed. So the first component here actually helps us to define the application. Like this application, uh, could uh, we can actually define the resource usage for this application. Like what is the resource that is required? for this uh, application to run the minimum and the maximum resources. And we call also define like, let's say I am assuming my application high availability, then I can actually define the number of replicas that my application requires and the various other features. Like I could actually define like if my application needs to be scaled up or scaled down and I can also define the upgrade strategy, like how my application needs to be upgraded, like whether everything needs to be, uh, whether we require a downtime or whether it needs to be uh, phased out, the upgrade needs to be phased out uh, in a sequential manner. So all these things we can define in this kind of uh, defined Kubernetes deployment or resources section. So the next thing is now let's assume we have defined everything and we have deployed our application. So how do we expose our application? Our application could be running on a Kubernetes cluster, but we need some point or some some service or something to actually uh, access the application. So that is why we have this Kubernetes services. So here, right, we will be defining what type of um, exposure is required for the application, whether an application requires a internal exposure or whether it requires external communication or uh, it exposed to the web and everything. So now we will look into uh, the details of uh, how this is done in a Kubernetes. 
So the first component that we are going to see here, right, for, for this, we require a component called pod controller. So I'm going to open this link here. So the pod controller uh, in Kubernetes actually controls a pod of how it is deployed and everything. So these are like kind of a various uh, uh, pod controllers that are available. The one is deployment, replica set, stateful set, daemon set, and everything. So the widely used ones are like kind of the deployment and a stateful set. So now for this example, right, I'm going to show how a deployment actually works. So in the previous session, actually, we uh, deployed an uh, Nginx pod here. So this Nginx pod is still running. So let's assume a scenario where this pod is going to be deleted for some reason. So I'm going to delete this pod. Let's assume this has been deleted for some reason. So this pod is deleted now. Let's wait for the pod to be deleted. So the pod is deleted now. So no, no, we don't have any pods running on this specific uh, uh, Nginx pod running. So what if uh, I need a kind of a controller which, act, which actually spins up this pod, even if someone accidentally deletes or if uh, uh, the node on which it, this pod is deployed is has some issues. So that is why we have this kind of a uh, pod controller called deployment. So in this uh, lab, right, I'm going to create a deployment here. So instead of this Nginx image, I'm going to use an image from uh, other image here that is from Quad. So I'm going to uh, see here, I'm creating a deployment. The deployment will be of the same type that is Nginx. The image is from, um, uh, the image is from a different uh, image repository. And this also is kind of an Nginx image. And the number of replicas I'm defining here is two. So I'm going to deploy this now. So now let's uh, see, I'm going to give get deploy or the get deployment. So this will show the Nginx is deployed. And the, there are two pods. I mentioned two replica sites. Right? So that is why it is mentioned as two by two. So now, now let's see get pods. So you can see the two pods of Nginx are running here. So uh, th that is why it is mentioned as two out of two and up to date is two and the available pods are two. So this has been started just now. So that is why we have this get pods. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give get pods hyphen wide. So here you can see the node on which this is deployed. So the, the node, these are kind of the node IPs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to delete one of the pod here. And let's see how this deployment spins up an other pod automatically. So I'm deleting the second pod that is running here. And I'm giving delete. Let's wait for it to recreate. So, so you can see it has automatically created another pod. So this pod has a different name here. That is uh, that we create deleted WTL2X, whereas this one has got NX, N6NML. So, so the Kubernetes deployment actually will monitor like whether it has got two replicas at a given time. And this replica is not, if it is not available, it will automatically spin up an other pod here. So you, even if you see the pod IP, right? So for this, the pod IP was 192.168.16.78, and here the pod IP is different. And even the node on which this is deployed, right? This is deployed on another node, not the same node where it was previously deployed. So that is the feature of this deployment. So using this deployment, right, we can actually even uh, uh, do an upgrade. Like for example, if I need to upgrade this application to a uh, next available version, then I can give a command wherein uh, I can actually, what is it, upgrade it in a kind of a rolling fashion. Like one, uh, only once, uh, one pod will be upgraded first and then followed by the next pod. So this will actually ensure the high availability of the application. So moving back to the slide, right? Uh, so here you can see the controller options and I have pasted here two of the widely used pod controllers. The one is the deployment, the other one is stateful set. So the major difference between these two is like the deployment is usually used for stateless application. 
so the application which doesn't bother about a session uh, uh, affinity or transactions right uh, they will prefer to de to be deployed as a kind of a deployment so if you can see here right i have three replicas so all this three uh, will be having three pods but the same three three pods will be using the same storage layer whereas in the case of stateful set right so this as the name suggests, is predominantly used for stateful applications. So even here, right, we'll have these three replicas here, but these replicas will each have its own storage. So ideally, this will be used for applications uh, which require as uh, what is it, session affinity, transactions, and details to actually provide. So yes, uh, yeah, this one example is a stateful set example would be predominantly databases. So the databases ideally when deployed in Kubernetes, right, it should be deployed as kind of a stateful set because each data, each pod should have its own kind of an, uh, uh, storage access to fetch in a transaction or uh, refer a transaction. So that is the difference and that is why we need this pod controllers. So the now next step that is the, uh, we have defined this uh, Kubernetes for, uh, using the pod controllers and everything. So the now next step is how do we expose the application? For exposing a Kubernetes application, right, we have the following options. Like uh, we introduce a concept called services. I'm going to open. So what is a service? Service is kind of a layer of abstraction on 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 top of these pods. So as we uh, seen in the previous two pods are running here. So now if I want to access my application, how do I know which one to apply, uh, which pod to communicate? So that is why we introduce a layer on top of it. So this would ensure that the load is equally spread to all the replicas on a given, uh, for a given pod. Like uh, for the server itself, right? We have three different types. The one is cluster IP, load balancer, and then node port. So what is cluster IP? So the cluster IP, right? Uh, it is used for internal, Application. Like, for example, I am going to deploy a kind of an uh, ap application A, which needs to communicate with application B, which resides on the same cluster. So this is kind of an internal communication between two pods. So in order to provision this, right, I can create a service so that this service would be used as a reference for the other uh, application to communicate with this. So this is predominantly cluster IP is used for internal communication. So the next one is the load balancer. So what does a load balancer do? So the, this service type load balancer, right? It interacts with the cloud load balancers or any external load balancers and exposes the application. So predominantly, right, this is used for external communication. So the now the next one is cluster type, next service type is node port. So this node port option is predominantly used for a non-web application, like a database. Like let's say we have a Postgres deployed in our cluster and this Postgres needs to be external exposed outside of a cluster. So the Postgres default port is 5432. So if I need to expose this port, I will be defining the service type as a uh, node port. So once the, uh, I define the service, right? So this port will be accessible on all the nodes in a cluster, like all the worker, right? On all the work on specific 5432 will be open. So in this uh, example, you can see the 3000 port is open on all the nodes. So you can pick and choose the node on which you want to connect locally to that given DB. So these are kind of a service types. So before we go on to ingress, right? I will show like how we can expose this uh, uh, service uh, using this command. So I'm just going to this command and show you like what exactly is happening. So here I'm going to create a service. So the service will expose the deployment. So the deployment created, right? Uh, where is it? The deployment name is nginx. So I'm giving deployment slash nginx and the name of the service is going to be nginx service and the type is going to be cluster IP. So it is predominantly for internal communication. And the port, the predominant, uh, the, the port on which this is going to be exposed. So I'm going to expose this service on port 80. And the target port, so the port uh, where the container is actually exposed. So this is also going to be NJ80 uh, because this is a web server. So I'm going to pick and choose uh, both the ports as uh, 80. So now I'm going to create this service. So if I need to see the service that is running, right, I need to give kubectl get service. So now you can see uh, nginx service is created and th this is this has a uh, cluster IP and this is exposed on port 80. So if you notice the difference, right, the pods that we listed down here, these are kind of a dynamic, will have it 
will have will be changing dynamically so where is the service ip right once created the service ip or uh, the ip for the service will remain constant so that is why we can actually use this nginx service and uh, the pod can easily come internally it will refer to this pods which dynamically change so that that is why that is how we create a service so next next one that we are going to see here is ingress controller so what is ingress controller so the ingress controller is nothing but a layer on top of this service. So uh, on any production cluster, right, we could be having multiple uh, applications that are exposed uh, outside, like uh, that will be exposed to the outside world. So ingress controllers acts as kind of an allow us to define the rules through which we can communicate with this service. So we will be defining the, so this is like kind of an client and the ingress will be on top of this uh, service so we'll be defining the various rules here so based on this rules right uh, this ingress will route the traffic to the respective service like for example in this diagram right you can see foo.mydomain.com so whenever someone is going to uh, enter this url this ingress will uh, uh, direct it to this service one so if it is going to be another dns it will again be routed to service two so it will have all these rule sets defined internally to route the traffic so ingress will be on top of service and service is kind of a uh, uh, layer that that uh, helps in routing the traffic to the respective pods so so now we have seen the service and types uh, and the ingress and ingress controller so what is port forwarding so port forwarding is something like uh, i have uh, deployed an application into kubernetes and i want to check like how the application is be behaving locally on my laptop so using this port forwarding right i can actually check the application behavior uh, only on the current environment where i port forward like for example in this lab session right uh, i'm going to run this command port forward so you can see i have given kubectl port forward and the service name so the service name here is nginx service that we previously created and 9595 is the uh, port on my local laptop where this uh, service is going to be exposed. And 80 is the Nginx service port. So you can see the port here, right? I think we gave some get service. So the, this port is accessible on port 80. So I've given this 80 here. So now let's see how this is going to behave. So now I can copy paste this and access this locally. So you can see the application that I have deployed is uh, I, can, I can actually visualize this application locally on my laptop, which I have deployed now. So this is the uh, advantage here. Of, it is used to locally check how the application behaves. So this is about the two components that we majorly use before we deploy a pod into a Kubernetes cluster. Hi, so, yeah. so while running some comments, can you please increase? I mean, for the font in the comment. So there are some. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. I will do. Uh, what I will do is now. Now we have a lab session. Uh, I will meanwhile work on increasing the font for the res uh, respective sessions. Now we'll hand it over to Karthik for uh, deploying a cloud native application in a Kubernetes cluster. Over to you, Karthik. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So last session we. I've gone through how to build a uh, Kubernetes cluster locally on your laptop. So I still have a copy of that session opened. So it is, this is basically a WSL machine prompt. And we have that cluster also up and running. So let me just verify that. So what we are going to do now is to deploy a, a, you know cloud application, not cloud application, cloud native application. On, on this Kubernetes cluster, okay? So first, um, so what is a cloud native application? Uh, so there are a few standards uh, that we can uh, say it has to confirm um, when we talk about cloud native application. So it, the application should be um, capable of running anywhere or everywhere uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in, in any sort of environment. That is what the cloud native specification says. And one another factor is that it should also be scalable uh, resilient and accessible, um, and uh, yeah, it, it should be like uh, uh, you know, it, it can uh, also coordinate with the other sim applications seamlessly, with other uh, you know co um, applications that are going to run. In a, when we talk about in a front end or back end kind of environment, 
So what we're going to do deploy today is a similar application. Um, so it is built on uh, React JS, and uh, so we're going to deploy this application on our Kubernetes cluster. So for which uh, I'm going to take a copy of the code, application code. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, let me share. Yeah, hope you can see my screen now. Yeah, we can. OK. So let's talk about the application a bit. Uh, first, so I, I, as I mentioned, that it's a simple React application that is built on uh, top of JavaScript framework. And uh, it's going to mimic an interface of uh, how Netflix looks like. So the only exception is that it is not going to have a backend that can talk to storage and get the movies or the videos uh, directly playable on your browser. So what we will be seeing is um, that is what the application is all about. Um, so let's, without talking much, let's jump out to the deployment part. So I have the uh, application built. Uh, you know, the code has been already uh, written, and it is available on the uh, GitHub repo. So I'm going to copy that and paste it onto the terminal. So hope the font is visible, at least. Yeah, it is. OK. So let's have a quick glance at the code as well. Uh, so before we deploy this application, a container, we need to build a container out of it. So the code that we have written as the uh, application code. Sorry, yeah. So this is the, uh, the complete application. application. And, and uh, let, me, let me open it again. Yeah, so here is my source code uh, folder. It has a bunch of JavaScript files within it. So we're not going to go through all the source code. Um, so what we are concerned more about is the Docker file. So this is a file that is going to help us help us out of uh, you know, building a container image out of this application, full source code. So we are going to build a Docker image now. And uh, I, I think we, you, we already created a repository in the session if you, if you remember, uh, when we deployed the K3D cluster, we created a, a repository called a Dev Registry, and uh, which is uh, also visible in Docker command. So, so this is the registry server. Uh, Dev Registry. So and it, is, uh, and it is exposed on port number 3500. Okay. So we're going to create an image and then push it onto this registry. So for that. So let's go back to the workshop material. Um, this we have done. Yeah, this is the command which is going to help us uh, creating an image. I'm already inside that folder. So I'm just giving a Docker up. build command and my application name is Netflix iPhone clone with a the uh, version of the application, and then uh, build that is that my Docker file is there. So this is going to take some time. So we can have a look. So it's having two stages. One is the build part, where it will build the artifacts out of the source code. And then in the sec second stage, we are going to create a deployment of, uh, out of the artifacts, which we created in the first stage. Also going to build in a bundle and engine image within the uh, and, and uh, uh, going to expose it on port 80. So, so that, that is why it's a simple Docker file. Okay. So and, and source code. Well, okay. 
And then we also have, have a see, folder called manifest. manifest. Have a couple of Kubernetes uh, resources written. Uh, um, basically, we want uh, the, uh, 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 a standard way of deploying your application instead of uh, Kubernetes. So it will have the uh, structure similar. Running within the cluster, you have the specifications for the application. So, and uh, it is it has to fetch the application from this registry port number. That these are all we already discussed where the application is going to be stored or uh, in a containerized version. Okay, and there's the image and all these things are coded in the image tag. Okay, so this is a, a simple deployment file. And um, to access this application, we will also require a service component. Uh, return. It will have all the basic uh, attributes and API version metadata stick. And uh, uh, it will have the container port on which is exposed the application and then the target. And uh, I'm going to create a but it is purely subject you can use cluster API. Well. Anyway, API. we are not going to access this application using the service. We will be creating an object, which I'll be uh, discussing in the later part of the session. Back to the zero, like, uh, slides, you know, like, we'll about the uh, how this cluster is built, um, what are the different we had for our cluster, uh, the host machine, Docker, uh, Kubernetes cluster, inside which we, we have four service node and then three worker nodes. Uh, in each worker node, we have multiple pods running. Now, as Arun spoke about uh, these components uh, as well, like the four power services and deployments. Like now, we we're going to have multiple within the uh, worker nodes. Okay, now how are we going to access this pod? Is we need a service for it. Okay, so the service, as as mentioned, he uh, has mentioned that we are going to have three types of services: cluster API, node port, or load balancer. Um, in our uh, demonstration, which we going to have for our application, it, it is node port service okay now when we have the service created um, okay okay as in that this is a service okay the service uh, accessible from outside okay um, so we need a external uh, service the, the service can typically communicate between the cluster resources between the pods so by default it will be having a cluster IP it will not have a uh, public IP associated with it so we need to have a public IP associated uh, so that we can access the application which is uh, no, which is running inside one of the pod through the service so we, we're going to spin up one more uh, component called an ingress. Okay, and then this ingress is going to access this operation. So the communication is going to happen like this. And then from service to the pods. Okay. But again, Ingress will not have a direct communication, direct uh, accessibility. Ingress has to come through uh, a public IP. Ingress cannot be directly associated with a public IP. So we're going to have a 
load balancer component installed. So that is also we already installed. If you remember, we have installed a component called Metal LB. Okay, so this load balancer is accessible from an external world or from uh, anywhere, in, uh, even from your laptop, you can directly access it. Uh, for our laptop, uh, we are going to make use of uh, a private IP, but in real world, it will be a public IP. Okay, this load balancer will have a public IP through which we can access our application. So load balancer will talk to Ingress. Ingress will talk to the service and then from service, we're going to talk to the directly to the application and get the response delivered to our browser. So let's go back and see uh, the application build. So it is still building. So yeah, so basically, uh, if you want to access the uh, URL of an application, you need to have a public IP. But let's see what are the services that are available currently in the cluster. Yeah, Karthik, can you please include the terms yeah. of this as well? Sorry, 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 sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a few set of services already running in the cluster. One of them is the ingress controller, which we are already talked about, right? Ingress Nginx controller. So through this Ingress, we are going to access our application. And this, as you can see, the all the services has an cluster IP, but none of the services has an external IP associated. But that is the Ingress controller has an ex external IP uh, associated. So through this IP, we'll, we can access the uh, applications that are running inside the cluster so that we can verify um, using your browser. So this browser is running inside your WSL environment which you can, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you can check with uh, whatsmyos.com. And uh, that is going to return Linux. Yeah, so which means you are inside the WSL machine. Sorry, since the machine is building, I'm busy with the build, build process, it's, it's causing my machine to slow or to slow down. So you will see a response like this, uh, which means we are able to reach our ingress controller, which is Nginx ingress. So that means the the configuration, whatever we created so far, is working perfect. So yeah, when we talk about the um, the container build, so we see our application build has already started. Build is completed, in fact. Uh, so now I think, yeah, it's creating uh, artifacts for the build. So the next process will be a deployment phase where it will create a container image out of uh, the artifacts which we which has been created. So this is just a front-end application. Uh, it will not have any back-end uh, 
application uh, like uh, an RESTful API services or uh, storage or a database. Nothing is going to be associated with this application. It's just a simple application that will provide you only the UI um, for the interface. Uh, compilations completed. So this should be a, a much faster on most of the systems because this laptop is eight years old, so you will find it a bit sluggish. But it should be ideally faster. Okay, so don't be uh, about the slowness which we see here. Um, yeah, it's almost done. Right. So application is built, and uh, we have a container created with the name netflix hyphen clone version one point zero. OK, so let's go back to the continue with the session. So next step is to tag this build, uh, the uh, container which we built. This is available locally in the storage on your local hard disk. Now we are going to uh, tag it and then send it to the container registry. OK, so these two commands will do that function. So in the first command, I, I'm tagging that with the registry. And then second command, I'm pushing that image onto our local registry, which is private registry. So it has been successfully pushed. So it is now um, the image is uh, serviceable from content, uh, from a Kubernetes cluster. We can you know, call this image and get a pod created out of it. OK. So yeah, so this step, yeah. So this one we completed is completed. We are on to the deployment now. So as I uh, initially spoke about the manifest file, we're going to uh, create these two uh, resources uh, on the cluster. Uh, yeah. So, so we are going to create the Kubernetes subjects using the directly apply command, kubectl apply f and in the folder in which the manifests are written. Am I within the folder? No. Uh, let me log into the folder, application folder, and then run this command kubectl. Okay, we got uh, a deployment as well as service created. So it's Saying zero of two already, it will be ready. Uh, yeah. So we got uh, both applications up and running. You can see the pods related to the applications. Yeah. You can see two two uh, two pods each running. Uh, probably on a different worker node. Let's see. Describe, or if you want to see more de details about the parts, you can you know run this command and check. But otherwise, it is not required. You can see on which node it is running, okay, and these sorts of information is available. It, it is running on the agent one, which is the node one, and uh, the port at which the pod is uh, exposed, and these details, okay. So now uh, we have deployed the application completely deployed. Now we want to access the sub this application. Um, so we have a service and uh, still need this object and then uh, load balancer to access this application. How are we going to associate this ingress to the, uh, or how, do, how are we going to map the ingress to the service? So we have an ingress controller, but we do not have a mapping between the ingress and the service. Okay, so that is what we are going to create now. 
Um, yeah. So before that, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, we need a real DNS, but unfortunately we do not have a DNS. But we can fake the DNS entry uh, using these two commands. Basically, we are going to get the uh, load balancer IP. Okay, if you if you check that variable value, it will. It is. You know, I'm just going to print the load balancer IP. Okay, now uh, I'm going to map this load balance IP to the uh, dummy domain. So th my dummy domain is this one, netflix netflix-clone.kcdchennai.in. Okay, that entry has to be added to etc host file. So this way you can avoid the uh, need for a real DNS uh, mapping, um, a real DNS entry or a valid domain name. Uh, you need not have it have in uh, for your testing. So you can create a, your own domain and then map it with the load balancer IP, and then you can access this application. Now, if you try to access this application, it will not be available. We need to create an ingress mapping. So next, we will be creating the ingress object. So uh, the step to create the ingress object is uh, yeah, this one. So it says that ingress object has been created. Um, so basically, the ingress object is nothing but uh, again an Kubernetes manifest. You can see the manifest details by just running this command. This command is not given in the workshop material, but if you want, you can check what is going inside that uh, ingress object. As you can see, all the Kubernetes resources will have the standard uh, attributes: API version, kind, metadata, spec. And uh, the object's uh, attribute is going to define only within the, in, uh, you know, in the, in the sub chart, sub, sub uh, manifest, like the attribute that are specific to the resources are the only ones that are going to change. So uh, this is the domain name which we are going to use for our application. And that is going to talk to my service called Netflix-Clone-Service. This service we have created as part of the, OK? Now this application should be accessible right from the browser. Yeah, it's pretty much opening now. You can see the page which is similar to what a, a real Netflix page looks like. Um, basically, it is mimicking the behavior, but it, will, it is not going to have the entire uh, subset of web series or uh, anything of that kind. So we're, what we are, we'll be seeing here is uh, can, since my system is running very slow. It's going to render a lot slower than what it is going to be. So that's what and it is your own Kubernetes cluster. So this cluster is zero cost. You can run and dispose at your own wish. So that's pretty much about the application deployment. So what we have seen uh, is a deployment of cluster. And then we have seen how to create a deployment out of it, and then created a service, ingress, load balance, all these things, how we done the mapping, all this has been uh, as part of the session. So now if you want to, as a, as a developer, if you wish to update your code, so is um, basically you will be uh, updating the source code. Uh, suppose I'm modifying some code in the app.js file, uh, and I want to, uh, replace this text with uh, Netflix, um, but fake, and then save it here. So now this application, if I want to put it in the content uh, Kubernetes cluster again, I have to rebuild this image with a different tag. 
So again, you got to go to this uh, first step in the deployment application stage, where you have to code it with version 2.0, okay, and then run all these commands, rerun these commands once again. So the cluster will automatically see that it it has uh, in 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 a, in a GitOps environment, this will be automatically spinned up to a newer version, but in your development environment, what you have to do in addition is that you have to delete these services, uh, delete this deployment, and recreate it. So this is the only step that will be required and you, whenever you want to change your core and then redeploy it. Um, so that's all. The, the manifest uh, uh, are all going to be remain the same. You can just update the manifest and deploy it. So basically, this deployment is uh, using uh, uh, latest. It will be 1.0 initially. Now, if you want to change the application to version 2.0, change it to 2.0, and then uh, this command kubectl apply iPhone apply manifest. So that will uh, you know respin your application with the newer version of your application. Uh, so whenever you change the code, just change the deployment version, change the image version, and then reapply the code. Uh, of course, you need to rebuild the image to then uh, whatever version that you want to build. So this is how a uh, uh, cloud native application is usually built in the cluster, Kubernetes cluster, and now it is deployed. Yeah, so that's pretty much. Uh, so back to. Uh, yeah. Your voice is not very clear. Can you please start the? Yeah, can you see my screen and can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, it's very low. Yeah, you can see, but the voice is a bit low. Yeah, better. Much, much better. better. Okay. Okay, let me maybe increase my voice uh, as I speak. Okay, so uh, now we are going to see we have deployed. Uh, our cluster on an, uh, this one, like uh, uh, we have deployed the cluster and we have also uh, started running our application. So now we come to the uh, interesting part, which is the observability. So observable, observability here consists of metrics collection, logging, and also uh, basic troubleshooting. So in this session, right, first we'll see the metrics, how the metrics are collected. So Kubernetes by itself, right, provides an optional component called uh, a metric server. So this metric server is actually uh, can be opted on a Kubernetes cluster. So this provides basic a basic metrics components like the C resource usage of a CPU uh, memory of a given pod or a node. Like for example, right in that uh, cluster that we have deployed, uh, I'm going to give kubectl op node. So you can see the uh, usage, CPU usage and the memory usage of each of the individual nodes that we have deployed. So similarly, right, if I need to see the pod usage, I need to give CPU top pod. So here you can see the Nginx pod that we deployed, right? You can see the amount of core, CPU cores and the memory that this particular uh, pod requires. So though this metrics uh, server is available, the, 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 uh, the metrics that it provides is actually quite less and it is not actually something that uh, uh, we we are on a distributed cluster expected. So that is why we move on to a kind of an uh, advanced metrics collection tools called Prometheus and Grafana. So let me move on to this workshop uh, tab. So as uh, just a quick overview, like so in the traditional logging and metrics tool, right, we have seen like uh, uh, how the IP address and the environments remain stable. Whereas in the case of uh, a cloud native application, right, the IP or the uh, or the node where that specific pod is going to be deployed is not going to be constant and it could uh, change over time. So like in this example, we have seen, right, uh, uh, where we had this pod IP changing from one, one IP to another when this pod was uh, actually uh, deleted and brought back. So for this kind of dynamic changes, which uh, literally happens in cloud native, we need a kind of an advanced uh, uh, monitoring mechanism or metrics collection mechanism. So that is why we have uh, the Prometheus here. So the Prometheus is like uh, is actually stores its metrics in a time series data, and it collects the information periodically from all the sources uh, from which it is uh, it can collect. 
So for example, let me open this Prometheus uh, uh, documentation. So this is again a CNCF project and it is a graduated CNCF project. So if you can see here, so the Pro Prometheus joined the CNCF in 2016 and the second hosted project after Kubernetes. So it is actually widely used metrics collection tool. So what we are going to do now is as part of this, uh, uh, I will come through the uh, architecture uh, here at a high level, but before that we will start with the uh, installation of the uh, one. So the, because this installation uh, takes a few minutes, so probably we will just start with this installation. And as we go, I'll explain the architecture. So I'm going to, as I mentioned earlier, right, namespace is kind of a uh, logical partition within a cluster. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a namespace monitoring. So I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to create a namespace monitoring here. So the monitoring namespace is created. So now I'm going to deploy the Prometheus stack. So before going to uh, before deploying it, right, I would like to quickly give an overview of Helm. So we are going to use Helm here stack so what is helm here so helm i think we had a uh, beginner session previously where helm concepts was explained so just a quick overview here helm is kind of an open source package manager for kubernetes similar to what we have for windows pack or apt for ubuntu helm is a package manager for kubernetes so we can actually bundle all uh, an entire application with kind of uh, all the services like in this example right you saw like we created a deployment a service and everything individually so with regards to helm right we can bundle all this together in a kind of an uh, uh, software kind of thing and we can deploy it uh, at one go so we uh, this uh, for in order to install that particular this one right we need to add that repo so here we are we are, we are adding this repo prometheus community and this is the uh, github link for this prometheus where this particular helm uh, charts are located so in my cluster, i have already deployed i have already added this chart so you can see this uh, this prometheus community is already added so uh, i'm going to directly install this prometheus stack i'm going to give a helm install so this will take some time so uh, during this time we will see like what are the uh, uh, high level components that are uh, required? So at the top right, we have this Prometheus, which actually helps in pulling the metrics from various targets. So in this case, the targets could be at the node level or like uh, the node level, like we have multiple worker nodes, right? That's Prometheus would be collecting this metrics from each of this node. And it will also be interacting with the Kubernetes APIs to collect all the metrics data. So once this data is collected, right? Then it, we have another, in this Prometheus stack, we have another component called So in Alert Manager, we can actually create rules. So whenever a threshold or something is hit, right, this Alert Manager can be used to alert the end users. So it could be either an email or it could be any a third party, uh, uh, or what is it, uh, alert, alert triggering app. So, so we have this Prometheus and Alert Manager. The next component here is the Grafana. Grafana is kind of an additional component which is actually used for visualization because we have all these metrics and how do we actually visualize or uh, uh, understand like what exactly does this metrics do. So that is why we use this Grafana component. So we can actually build attractive dashboards that can actually help us or uh, uh, screen like what exactly is happening at a given point. So I think this is still taking time. So I'll just see if the pods are getting created here. It's still being created. Let's wait for some time. So as part of this Helm packaging, right, we uh, this not only packages since I mentioned this as a Prometheus stack, right? So it actually this stack will include both all these three components, like the Prometheus Alert Manager and Grafana. All these are bundled together, and we will also few other components that are required for this interaction with the node level components. So now we can see this Prometheus stack is deployed on the cluster. So now I'm going to give get pods here. So you can see the various components deployed here. So now we will go through 
component now. So the first component that we are going to see here is the node exporter. So as I mentioned, right, uh, so the Prometheus will help in collecting of metrics from the node level is actually deployed on each of the uh, nodes in a given cluster. So it will be running on each of this node and it will help in collection of this metrics at the node level. So the next one here we are going to see is the operator. So operator is kind of a centralized component manage all other components that are deployed here so it will check and validate like how it behaves and it it, it, it uh, basically helps in the operation or the availability of the rest of the components so the next component these are all the node exporters so the next component that we are going to see is the grafana so grafana as i mentioned is for visualization so the next here is the cube state matrix so the cube state matrix is used for collecting the metrics that are available at at the API level. So it will be interacting with the Kubernetes API calls to get the Kubernetes uh, API metrics. So the next one is alert manager, which is used for alerting or alert triggering to the end users. So that this one is kind of a Prometheus deployment, which actually hosts the Prometheus uh, operator or the Prometheus actual Prometheus. We have deployed this and everything here is up and running. So the next step that we are going to do now is so we have installed this and we are going to uh, expose this GUI, uh, GUI using port forward. So first I'm going to expose the, uh, so as before, right, before I execute this command, I will give a get service here. You can see the uh, get service like various. So as I said, right, uh, uh, with Helm, we, we everything, everything will be bundled together. So the deployment, like if I give deployment here, so we'll be seeing the deployment manifest being deployed, the service, and everything will be uh, installed in one, uh, one single click. So that is the advantage of using Helm. So now we have the service here. Let me, uh, here, let me move this to the top. Now I'll copy paste this uh, command to port forward. So, so th this is kubectl and the namespace is monitoring and I'm, I'm uh, executing this port forward and the service is Prometheus stack cube prom Prometheus, which is uh, mentioned here. And this will be uh, exposed on port 1990. So I'm going to give an ampersand so that it can run as a back backend. So, Next, I'm also going to expose this. So before we expose, right, let, let me first show you the Prometheus GUI. This is exposed port 1990. So this is the Prometheus GUI. And by default, right, it has got various metrics, ready-made metrics available for us to consume. Like for example, right, we saw that node exporter that I showed earlier, like we had this uh, uh, node exporter that is running on various uh, nodes individually. So I'm going, just going to see what are the node level components that are available. So let's say we are interested in kind of a memory level components. So previously in the kubectl top node, right, we were able to visualize only these two components. Whereas here we have multiple metrics that are readily available. So like, for example, I'm going to click this memory active bytes and I'm going to give execute here. So I will be having the node level metrics for all the components that has been installed. Suppose if I want to visualize this component in a kind of a graphic, right? So I can just click this graph option here and I can see all the metric level components. So since this has been installed just five minutes back, the metrics has been flowing only for the last five minutes. So this is about the Prometheus. So apart from this, right? Uh, I mentioned about the cube uh, related components. That is a cube matrix that we have deployed here. Like for example, we have this cube, uh, where is it? So the cube state matrix. So let me check if, if there are any cube related metrics available here. So these are like kind of an API information that it can pull. Like for example, I'm just going to keep de deployment created and see if I'm get getting any metrics. So it will list down all the deployments that, have, that are created on this cluster. So this is how the uh, Prometheus works. So now we have this metrics collected in Prometheus. Now let's see how the visualization of this looks in Grafana. Let me actually put uh, this Grafana here. So similar to uh, the, uh, the earlier port that we did, right? Uh, here, we are going to mention the uh, namespace is monitoring. And this is the port forward command and the service. And the service name here is Prometheus tag Grafana. So I'm going to expose it on port 1991. 
So it is now exposed now. So it requires a credentials by default, right? When we are going to install Prometheus directly, uh, the credentials for this is admin and slash prom. So we we uh, we can actually customize this uh, credentials, but we are not going to uh, get into it. So we will use the default credentials that is available, and I have logged into Grafana. So similar to Prometheus, right? Uh, Grafana offers many uh, readily available dashboards. Like these are kind of the dashboards that are readily available, and we can quickly check them or uh, use them to check like how it works. Like for example, I'm going to click this node exporter nodes so to see the node level metrics. So here I have uh, the various nodes and I can check this uh, uh, quickly by click of a button. So all, or I can even monitor Prometheus from using this dashboard. Like for example, right, uh, I have this Prometheus dashboard that is readily available. And if I click this, I will be having all the Prometheus level metrics. So it helps in building the dashboard and everything. So as I said, like we have this coming only recently since we have deployed this just now. So this is about the dashboard creation. Suppose if you want to customize this, if you want to create new dashboards, right? You can click this create and you can actually build your own dashboards. So you need the Prometheus query or uh, so the metrics that we displayed here, right? You need to build your own Prometheus queries and use that to build the dashboards. And apart from uh, uh, building new dashboards, right? We can also introduce new data sources into this. Like for example, by default Prometheus that we have installed now uh, here has a data source. Grafana uh, is kind of a default data source for this installation. But suppose if you want to add few other data sources. So if I'm going to click this data source, right? It, uh, this Grafana, with all this uh, monitoring tools like here you can see the various monitoring tools on the uh, even the databases through which it can uh, bring in the metrics so all these integrations are available so this is like a kind of a default visualization that we use whenever the Prometheus uh, based metrics collection is done so this is about uh, Prometheus so next we are going to go and look into the elastic stack so the, what is elastic stack so elastic stack basically uh, uh, is a log collection mechanism so it comprises of three to four components here so it as mentioned here right it is a combination of three open source projects and we also have another project here maybe i will just open this link here to go through the architecture so it comprises predominantly of four components the first component here is the Beats here. So what is Beats? Beats is like a component similar to the node exporter we have seen, right? Beat is a component that needs to be installed on each of the node in a cluster. So this beat will tail the logs that it needs to uh, forward. So it will be tailing that log and it will be sending it to the log stash. So log stash is kind of a uh, log aggregator. So it will actually aggregate or consume the logs from various sources and actually convert it or modify it as per the so once this uh, log stash is uh, the logs are received at this log stash, then it is forwarded onto Elastic Search. Elastic Search. So Elastic Search is basically a search and analytic tool. So it could actually uh, consume or uh, have a large amount of data, and using the data, it could it could actually crunch the data and bring you the desired results. Like search something, it actually. Search, search as it brings you the necessary result at very quick time, even though the size or the, uh, the log collection is going to be huge. So that is the functionality of this elastic search. So the next we have is a Kibana. So Kibana basically is again a visualization. So we have this, uh, uh, what is it? The logs and everything stored. And how do we visualize this data? So that is where we have this uh, Kibana uh, to visualize whatever log that we have. So similarly, uh, similar to uh, what you have seen here, right? We have I have provided this inst instructions to actually uh, install this. Like for example, we are going to uh, in in this scenario, right? I have already installed ELK stack following this instruction. The reason why I didn't want to do this in the workshop is like uh, it again takes some time, and I I don't want to uh, wait for the installation to complete. So here we have this installation done on this cluster. Let me show you. Here and I'm going to give QCTL. 
and the namespace that we have created is logging similar to uh, the prometheus right the repository is uh, the repository for this chart is available in this location so i have added this repository and i am installing each of this component one by one the first component is elastic search and then we are installing the file beat and then we are installing the kibana so let me uh, go into this logging and give you get pods So as you can see, these are the components that is installed here. Like for example, the file bit. So that I mentioned here, right? Uh, uh, the file bit is installed on uh, each of the nodes individually. So this helps in collecting the uh, what is it? Uh, the the log level information from each of the pods that are deployed on each of this node. So then we have this Elastic Search, which actually is kind of a search and analytic tool. And then we have this key, which is used for visualization. So if I give get service. I'll be able to have a service also is created here and I'm going to give get deploy. And the Kibana is deployed here, whereas uh, the elastic search will be right as kind of a stateful set. So you can see the three replicas and we have this three replicas that is zero, one and, and two here. So now what we are going to do now is we are going to port forward the elastic search and the Kibana to see how it actually looks. So first one I'm going to do is I'm going to port forward Elasticsearch as uh, before, right? I'm going going to give the namespaces logging and port forward. And the service will be the Elasticsearch master that we have here, and the port will be on nine two double zero. So this is exposed now. So let me check this on the GUI. So you can see this is uh, this actually means that the elastic search is working as expected you can see the elastic search master name here and all the build details and everything here so this this means elastic search is working as expected so now we are going to give the exp or, or visualize this using grafana so next i'm going to port forward the uh, kibana sorry again i'm going to run this as a background by background process so this will be exposed on 5601 yeah so now we have the kibana gui here so now let's see uh, let's see how the logs needs to be ingested so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to uh, give to the stack management here and create an index pattern so in uh, elastic search and everything we need to create an index pattern to actually visualize the log so what i'm going to do is i'm going to give file beat dot slash and i'm going to give the timestamp as this one and i'm going to create this index pattern so the index pattern is now created now let's see if the logs are coming in so i'm going to give analytics i'm going to give discover So you can see the logs are. So you can see all the logs are now available in Kibana for us to visualize. So similar to Prometheus, right? We have this query language where we can actually filter out or or uh, what is it? Filter a specific log or something and see how it behaves. So basically, now we have actually deployed both metrics collection and logging. So uh, use, using this uh, uh, lab instructions. So so now we are we are going to move on to troubleshooting right for any kind of troubleshooting the first step that we would require is kind of uh, how uh, we would be looking is for the metrics like what is the metrics or how the pod is behaving at a given point of time so we can ideally use this permit to see like what is the current status of the pod and then the next step here is to see how the lo logging or the logs has got any errors like at the pod level or at the container level so we have actually configured this tool and we, we can actually leverage this tool actually to troubleshoot an application so the troubleshooting basically in kubernetes is split into two components so the one is troubleshooting at the application level and the troubleshooting at the cluster so uh, I have referred the Kubernetes document link here because it has got the troubleshooting steps for each of the component or the serv services that exists. Like for example, it got specific instructions on how to debug a pod or how to debug a service or anything. So let's, for example, go into the debug pods. So 
usually we what we do is we give a describe what command so the describe what command when we give right it will give you like what are the events that takes place like for example and i will not go into this uh whatever uh this one that we have created i'm going to give kubectl get pods where we'll have this nginx so i'm going to give uh describe pod on one of these pods so here we can see the events that actually take place so you can see here, right? I, I think I earlier showed this, like how the pod is successfully assigned to your node and how the image is pulled and how the container is created and started. So whenever a pod or something is going to fail, right? We will have the event message clearly say like what exactly is happening. So that is why the first step that we do while uh, uh, debugging is uh, we have to look into this describe pod. So we need to st uh, check the status of the pod. Like you can see here, right? whether it is in ready state or this pending state or uh, kind of an error in image pool or something, we'll be getting this error. So we need to check this kind of uh, things. And the next step that we do obviously is to check the logs. Like for example, in this case, right, I'm going to just give kubectl logs and do a an log level, this one. So you can see here the logs doesn't have anything uh, uh what is it any kind of warnings or fatal because th this pod is running uh fine so that is why the logs doesn't show anything so this this is like uh how we ideally troubleshoot so apart from this right we can also leverage this prometheus and the uh and the kibana to actually see like uh, if there is any uh is it, uh, cpu spike or memory spike and everything so that is how the debug happens at an application level so now we are going to see apples at a cluster level. So again, we can actually list down the cluster here. Similar to get pods, we can actually give the uh, get nodes and list down the nodes here. And if we need to describe a node or something, we'll be able to see what exactly happens, similar to how we do for pods. And there also we'll be having an event and everything to see like what exactly so we have also another command called cluster dump info cluster info dump this will give a detailed information about overall health of the cluster we can collect this dump and actually we, we will be using this when when we need to uh, uh, what is it uh, analyze a cluster at a detailed level so this is one other command so this is how the troubleshooting works at the various level that is the and the cluster level so um, so this is about the observability and uh, that's all. Uh, uh, we are open to questions. Uh, yeah, hi. So it was an awesome session. So I've started the question trap. So waiting for questions. Uh, it So, yeah. so when are you like how long are you uh, playing with Kubernetes Mathavi? Oh you are on mute I guess. Sorry, so we are it is for the last almost four, four to five years. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I started my journey like a couple of months ago. So I'm learning all those things. So it was a very awesome event. I understood services. And Karthik, you? Yeah. Uh, almost the same level of experience as what I uh, have. Almost same as Arun. And uh, so before that, I was into cloud and virtualization. Um, with the VM double, not on containers. Um, so I'd like to know, like, uh, what, what are you using for your cluster testing development? Which cluster oh, do you for, like the most? Yeah, for me, I use uh, AKS, like Azure Kubernetes okay. Service, because yeah. I get uh, credits as a student ambassador. Okay, okay. Uh, then you should be, yeah, have the luxury to afford that. That's fine. <laughs> Perfectly fine. 
But uh, uh, this uh, workshop is mainly targeted at people who cannot, can't afford the cloud-based clusters, the EKS or GKE or the uh, AKS. So where they can't have the luxury or the affordability to spend uh, a large amount of uh, money to you know test and develop their own clusters. So K3D is absolutely a no cost cluster. You can run it wherever you want. You can install it on a VM. You can install it directly onto our Windows cluster or a Linux, a Linux machine or even on a Mac machine. And it is disposable as well. So that is one another. You can just create it. And then you can export the cluster and move it onto a different machine. That is also possible with the case of KTK. Oh. That is, uh, these are some of the features. And uh, many uh, cluster uh, create, creation tools like Kind or uh, you know Minikube doesn't offer the uh, functionality of having your own private registry. This is another functionality that is uh, very specific to KTK. So, and it's a community funded oh. project. You can, yeah, anyone want to <laughs> develop this product for they can. They can. Okay, so you folks use that for most of your uh, local testing environment, right? Yeah, and it's optimized for the uh, latest technologies, edge IoT. And uh, on these devices, if you want to run your containerized applications and you want to do it in a Kubernetes cluster-based environment, k is the only way to go because it is very light and it's the lightest cluster, I would say, which is current in the market. And what are you? One more K zero S is coming up. That is uh, based on K zero S image, uh, and that's even more lighter. But K three D is yes exceptional. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, and what about K three S? K three S, you know, K three D again uses the image, same image. K three S is the base image. What K three D uses. Okay. Uh, this one K three D as well as there is one another concept called B cluster. Again, there's a separate track that is going on the cluster. They also use the same image, K3S. Both the cluster and K3D use the same uh, backend. The base operating system is K3S. So that is how they are able to uh, uh, no, get, it, uh, get that lightweight uh, concept. I've used uh, K3S with background uh, to deploy no uh, uh, okay. and then do that, but it was interesting. So, yeah, yeah. Magrant is quite heavy because of the VM concept, but container is lightweight. So, yeah. yeah so then, as I think we don't have any questions for now today, we should end okay. this, right? Yeah, anyway, persons can always try the workshop uh, from the URL which we provided. They can uh, try that anywhere. And then they can, if they have, if at all they have questions, they can post it on the Slack channel. Yeah, it's just join our Slack and you can post questions over here. Yeah, yeah thank you, guys. Yeah, to help you. Thank you for the awesome event and so much knowledge. Uh, I'm stopping the broadcast. Thank you, Bobby.